Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our on the NORP and annotated NORP or the Notice of Recommended Educational Placement. Just a reminder, as you are entering the, the meeting room, please um, type in your name and your program so that we can use that for attendance, please. Also, we encourage you to make sure that you're muted on your end. We are trying to mute folks as they come into the meeting, but sometimes folks slip through. And we're also gonna be using the chat box for any questions um, that you may have um, throughout the webinar. So again, welcome and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us this morning. So the reason that the Bureau updated the NORUP and the annotated NORUP um, was for us to align with Chapter 14 placement options. Um, we also took into account the federal reporting um, for educational environments that we've been doing here in Pennsylvania for several years. As you know, those educational environments um, are reported to the the children's um, IEPs. So these changes to the NORUP also impacts, again, the, the child's IEP, as well as Pelican Early Intervention. If you're familiar with Chapter 14, you'll know that some of the placement options that we have been using in Pennsylvania are not included in Chapter 14, such as part-time, part-time, reverse mainstream, and itinerant um, outside of the home. So it's important for, for IEP teams to understand um, the new terminology or the terminology that we have in the annotated NORA. Um, so as you're meeting as um, IEP teams, you can have really good discussions um, with families as it relates to their child's um, placement options um, and their educational environments. You'll see on the screen the learning objectives for today and um, we really want folks to understand how the educational environment coding is tied to the NORUP. It's also tied to Pelican Early Intervention as well as the federal data collection. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen Furness, um, and I forgot to introduce ourselves. I apologize. I am Deb Knoll. I'm a division chief with the Bureau of Early Intervention Services and Family Supports, and with me is Jen Furness, um, an early intervention technical assistance consultant. Um, so Jen? Hi, everyone. Um, we really wanted to start out the webinar talking about this component of a child's story. And the fact that what we do in early intervention every day is um, old hat. We are doing evaluations, IEPs consistently, but we want to remember that it really is the first time for every family that walks through our doors. So this quote is just to remind us of that, that we document things to start to write down that story for each child that comes into our programs. This information is just a reminder again of that timeline and how we have so many opportunities even before serving a child to really start building that relationship with families. The NORP really does serve as a summary of what you're writing in that story that we develop through the evaluation report and the IEP. And knowing how they all connect and making sure that we are really being considerate of how positive interactions can be impacting the family, the child's interactions with our therapists, and really just connecting everything to make sure that we have that positive relationship built. The NORP, of course, is also that family's choice of whether or not they want to approve or disapprove the recommendations before service delivery. So the next few slides are really directly from Chapter 14. Uh, we know that most of you know that some of this information, but we wanna make sure that staff are reminded that parents have a right to receive reasonable prior written notice regarding a child's special education experience and the proposed actions by your preschool programs. And of course in PA, it's referred to as the NORAP. And as the LEA, we need to ensure that it's provided to parents in understandable language, in their native language, or show beyond reasonable attempt to try and do that for them in order for them to make their decision. 
And if the native language is not written, obviously we are obligated to provide reasonable attempts for oral translation or other modes of communication such as Braille in the native language to ensure those parents are able to understand what the NORUP contains. The family also needs to understand how the story is really fitting together so that they can make their informed decision. If our NORPs are worded too clinically or legally, it can really cause frustration. So we need to ensure that it is understandable language to the general public. When do we issue a NORAP? Uh, these four situations are directly from Chapter 14 as well. If the program initiates or changes the identification, evaluation, educational placement, or a FAPE change for a child, which for most of you is really when you are issuing a NORP most often. If the program refuses to initiate or change the above when requested. If the program initiates due process, or if the program refuses to agree to an independent educational evaluation. So what needs to be included in a NORAP? Again, directly from chapter 14, we have a detailed description of the action that the preschool program is proposing or refusing to take, an explanation of why the preschool program is proposing or refusing to take that action, a description of each evaluation procedure, assessment record, or report the preschool program used in deciding to propose or refuse the action, a statement that the parent has protections under the procedural safeguards provision in Part B of IDEA, telling the parent how they can obtain a copy of the procedural safeguards and what to do if they do disagree with the preschool's proposal, provide resources for the parent if they need help understanding Part B of IDEA or need additional supports, describe any other choices that the child's IEP team considered and reasons why these choices were not chosen, Describe other reasons why the preschool program proposed or refused an action. And you'll notice that each of these requirements are actually the itemed numbers of the NORAP that we will review shortly. So what really makes a good NORAP? We already know that a good NORAP is one that accurately explains the child's story, uses understandable language to the general public, and now we're actually going to bring up the version of the annotated NORAP that will assist you in guiding your staff about the changes that were recently made. And there was a question earlier regarding uh, whether or not it would be recorded, and these slides will be made available, and you will receive an email when that is done. So this is the annotated version of the NORAP, and we will review items one through four now, and then we will pause for three to five minutes to see if there are any questions on the first half before continuing. So item one is obviously the point where programs choose multiple or one box for the type of action proposed, depending on which portion you are at within the child's story. Item two is describing whether or not the action is proposed or declined. And it's easy to state that, that the following action is proposed or the following action is declined. Make sure that it's clear, listing out services but not location, you will often often find this version in a bulleted form in item two. Item three is the why for what is in item two. Why is it proposed or declined? And give fact-based reasons why. This is most often in sentence form and it's based right off of the bulleted list in item two. So we'd like to give an example here of what uh, this would look like and you may already be doing this. But for instance, if we are talking about um, giving itinerant services within a preschool, that would be the proposed action, and it may say itinerant services for 30 minutes per week. And the reason may be due to recent evaluation reports and goals that were developed within the IEP, specially designed instruction is needed in order to generalize skills. So you're really just proposing the action and then saying what information or evidence you have to support that. And then in item four, we want to ensure that everyone is having a logical, least restrictive environment discussion and writing down what actually occurred. So this does not mean automatically going through every placement category option, as that may not be relevant for each child, but making sure that you are having an accurate discussion with families. And to be clear in this section, only placement options that are in item seven that you will be seeing shortly belong here. So right now we are going to stop for about three to five minutes. So please type it. All 
All right, everyone, thank you for waiting. Uh, we were on mute and pause to make sure that we could review any questions that came into the chat box, and there were not any so far, so we'll continue moving through the annotated NORAP. Um, now you should see in front of you item five, and this is what we would list out to make the decision, such as progress monitoring, classroom observations, parent interview, team discussion, reevaluation, et cetera. Item six is the information that is out of the ordinary. So this may be something like a progress review meeting, a meeting for um, alternative or assistive communication devices that was agreed upon during the meeting. And then item seven is the placement categories according to chapter 14 in the federal reporting categories. So please note the differences here within the specific categories. You'll notice that the part-time, part-time code is going away, but we do want to note that the actual model of service delivery can of course still exist for kids. It's simply going to either end up being early childhood environment or early childhood special education environment, depending on the service level within each setting. So to determine whether current part-time, part-time kids will be ECE or ECSE, we will specifically be relying on service level within each setting, not total time at each setting. So this is a scenario that was actually sent to us prior to the webinar. Someone asked, what do we do if a child is receiving two hours per week in an ECE where they attend five mornings, but going to an early childhood special education classroom three half days per week? Due to the level of intervention within each setting, this child would be considered early childhood special education as seven and a half hours in that setting is more than the more than the services that are provided in the early childhood setting. In the rare instance that the service level is identical within an early childhood setting and an early childhood special education setting, err on the side of caution and that code would be early childhood special education. We would of course hope that efforts would be made to increase the ECE service level and decrease the early childhood special education service level to avoid that situation. The reverse mainstream code is also going away, but just like part-time, part-time, this would also be changing to either early childhood environment or early childhood special education environment. And this depends on three specific questions that we will actually be going over in a few slides. And then finally, itinerant outside the home has also gone away. This most likely will be coded as service at provider location, depending on your particular programs. In item eight, please note the change to the first box. Uh, we know that programs do refer to the disapproval meeting as an informal meeting. So we wanted to make sure that we were marrying the language that uh, program staff may be using with families. So if they choose a meeting to discuss, it now says an informal meeting to discuss. And now we will actually be transitioning to the education environment card. And this environment card is what the federal government, um, it does actually use to get information from our early intervention programs to report what Pennsylvania is doing as a state. So as a staff member, I remember I wondered where the 10 hours came from in Pelican on the screen, and this is exactly it. We tied the changes to the NORAP to the categories on this chart. So you'll notice that there is a specific section at the bottom left-hand corner regarding reverse mainstream. And this is to help you understand what your current reverse mainstream classrooms would be coded as moving forward. Some notes to think about is that now the teacher's certification is not in question and is not relevant in determining the code of the setting. Other definitions of what reverse mainstream is will not be relevant here, only these three questions. For instance, the design of the classroom is extremely relevant. If the curriculum is modified and specialized strategies are in place that modify the environment beyond a regular education environment, you would answer no to the question regarding is the classroom designed as a regular early childhood program. So now we're going to move back to the PowerPoint. And now that the NORAP coding is changing, the drop down options in Pelican will also be changing so that they're, they are consistent. So here's an example of what the screen will look like. If the child is in an early childhood environment for less than 10 hours per week, when you choose some other location, you will now have the same options that are considered in the educational placement of the child on the NORAP. The language within Pelican also states educational placement now, as you can see in that last question on the left. 
So now I'll hand it back over to Deb to talk about the different timelines for implementing the changes. Okay, so as we just looked at Pelican and the, the drop downs, um, those changes will be made with the April 2020 release um, and there will be training specific to that release. Um, so those changes will include not only the drop downs but also the NORIP form um, if your program um, goes to Pelican Early Intervention for that form. So the options for starting to use the, the updated NORIP is immediately after today. Um, once Pelican is updated and the release is, um, has happened in April, but we want all IEP teams, um, early intervention personnel, to be using the revised NORA by July 1st, 2020. Um, the Bureau does not expect programs to go and change every IEP once you decide to start using it. However, as teams meet for IEP meetings, the placement location should be updated to the new language. So if you have questions about the information that we just shared, again, we're encouraging you to type it into the chat box. Um, I believe we're gonna take another um, couple minutes to review any questions that we've received thus far, and then we'll be right back um, with you. We are going to mute, and um, so you won't hear anything for a couple minutes. Okay, thank you um, for your patience. We did receive a couple questions that we're gonna review. Um, the one question was from a statement that was um, shared earlier. Um, the program does not typically put frequency on a NORUP. So Jen's gonna talk a little bit about that. So that was uh, provided as part of the example for what to put in item two in your bulleted list of what is proposed or declined. And that remains a program decision. If you are currently putting frequency within that box, you may continue to do so. And if you do not typically use frequency, you do not have to either. So that again is up to your program. And the other question that we received is, so in number three, we should now be listing each proposed declined action in the box. So that has to do with items two and three coordinating with each other. So if you have a proposed or declined action listed in number two, it should be addressed in number three. They should match. Okay, great. Thanks, Jen. Yep. So those are the two questions that we received. Um, if in the future, after we um, finish today, you have additional questions or as you're um, training your um, IEP teams or your staff on the revised NORIP. If you have any questions, we're asking um, leaders to send those questions to our um, resource account, and you'll see on the screen um, that email address. Um, as Jen mentioned earlier, we will be um, posting the um, PowerPoint, and we have been recording um, the webinar, so that um, recording will also be posted. We will send an email out to everyone once um, both of those are posted on the um, leadership page on the EDA portal. So again, we're gonna finish up and thank you again for um, joining us this morning. Um, um, we wish you all a great week and um, we're giving you about an hour back to your busy, busy schedule. So thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you.